Thank you very much for all these very inspiring presentations from extremely difficult environments. I hope you have many questions to the presenters. So please, if you have a question, you see that mic. So please form a line behind that. And, and please just tell your name and where you're from, where you're coming from. Uh, so I'm uh, Rafi Babakanyan. I'm um, from Active New York. I'm a co-founder of the Crystal Math Working Group and also um, uh, on the board of Housing Works in, in New York. Um, I, I wanted to ask well, a couple of things. You, I think in one of your slides you talked about mapping 17 different... How did you do that? How, what, what mechanisms did you use to do that? Okay. So we uh, used a relative, it was a reasonably informal process. So we had a dent, we first worked in a classroom setting to uh, do what's called a pre-mortem or a pre-practice where you go out and it, it, uh, visual, uh, work through strategically what you're gonna do. So firstly, we have security teams who make the environment secure and remain spotters during the actual event in case there's either police or vigilantes uh, or people try to rob us. Then uh, the drug users uh, have a team leader, and then they just, uh, it's very informal, they just go in and start talking to drug users. In this first phase, they were introducing themselves as a group of drug users, explaining what they were doing, asking people what their stories were like. We were particularly, we had a series of questions we wanted to test, like there was a lot of transitions going on from injecting to non-injecting, there was a lot of police violence, there's a local forced detox center. So it was very conversational. And then we, and then they gathered that information, and then when the team, and that they worked in two separate teams covering two different areas, and then when they came back, we then document because they didn't want me to go out with them because I would prove a distraction on the on, on the process. Mm -hmm. So when they came back, we then documented it by getting them to tell the stories of what had, what had happened, and then uh, they also then picked up. In fact, Hadji particularly, they picked up as an advocacy case some with acute appendicitis under a bridge, yeah. and uh, in that case, we then actually got involved in advocacy to try to save his life. And it actually led to the drug users asking me after the needs assessment, please don't send us out again if we can't do something. We yeah. can't bear it. And that's why we started doing wound care interventions, just so they can offer something alongside the uh, consultation. But that's how you were able to identify these, these distinct kind of user groups. Uh, well, we knew we, we did that in the classroom beforehand. Yeah. So we basically got the drug user groups, the drug users, to sit down and say, where "Okay, wh where, where do you think the groups are?" So then yeah. we came up with the areas where somewhere drug users were living, somewhere they were using, and then we just uh, yeah, and then they went out to try to hit those areas. That was interesting. I just want to make one comment, which is that um, obviously the situation among urban gay men in New York is, is different, but the level of knowledge about shooting up is like make the, the whole thing that you're talking about with the, the syringe, it's, it's the same thing that we have and it, the, the knowledge of, well, I, I say like the knowledge of the most marginalized young uh, opiate user in, is so much greater about uh, how to properly inject than the most highly educated crystal meth user in New York. I mean, it's just a community knowledge that is there that goes from one person to another and, and then the level of denial and shame that prevents the other. Absolutely. But thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. My name is uh, Robert Power from Australia, Burnett Institute in Australia. Thank you, everyone, for, for a fantastic session. I mean, it's probably one of the best sessions by a long way. But my question goes right back to what Peter said at the very beginning. You kind of said, you know, we have public health, we have drug policy, we have resistance, we have user groups. And what I've noticed particularly at this conference, there's a possible danger of fragmentation. You know, we talk about the harm reduction movement, it's about the gay communities, if there's some homogeneous group. Now, and then we've seen various aspects of the conference where there's gonna be some conflict, and that's fine. What my question would be to the panel is, how do we ensure that we don't fragment our harm reduction movement, that in fact we make it healthier by unification? So what is the relationship between public health, policy, drug user movement, and the potential politicization? Because there was an interesting side meeting yesterday evening about the talk about let's, kind of, let's have a left wing of harm reduction movement. And I'm just a bit concerned about that because um, if I just may make a point, 
I work, I've been working 32 years in this field and spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia and in, I'm currently working in Tibet. And if we begin to be seen too much as a quasi-political movement, we may actually be doing a lot of harm in some of the areas, and Myanmar is a great example actually. I, I've, our institute's been there for 20 years and, and we've been relentlessly apolitical. So it's a huge question, I know, but I think it's something that we've really got to grapple with. Otherwise, we will end up with schisms and fragmentation. So it's a big question. I hope you can just begin to address that. Thank you. Anyone? Yeah, I'm happy to Yeah, I'll make a comment and then pass it, pass it down. Um, look, I, I think, for, for me, looking at the lesbian gay movement, for example, I think diversity has the potential to be a great asset and I think we have to learn how to manage that diversity and recognizing that like, no, there are, no, uh, like, no, ACT UP, for example, plays a different function than global advocates going into a UN meeting. If you did what global ACT UP do in the UN, you'd blow the whole thing to pieces and it wouldn't actually be very effective. However, if you go, when you go and use diplomacy skills outside a demonstration, it's not gonna work either. So I think it's about having that complementary skills and then learning how we communicate and think strategically. And you've also got to then apply it in local context. So we don't talk about rights in Afghanistan in quite the same time. We talk about well-being. No, you have to think about being careful, no, um, because drug user rights will just, no, put the drug users at risk. So we have to be very careful, and it's always about local application of, of, of process and principles that are maybe more common. That's true. <laughs> um, I think um, we, we can have, you know, our sort of like differing kind of perceptions on on the whole movement. I, I think there's room for, like you were saying, a diversity of you know strategies, a diversity of opinions, a diversity of you know even how we view how policy should change at all, right? I mean, there's some people I'm sure like strong about drug, drug legalization. There are other people who are concerned that it might get, it might worsen some problems under legalization and we should focus on uh, decriminalization. But I mean, we're all, I mean, we're all here together and like, it gives us, it gives us the ability to reflect on maybe where we can meet on, on certain issues, where we can, you know, collaborate on certain issues. Um, I, I think it's still, you know, it's harm reduction as a whole is still, you know, supportive of each other. I don't think, uh, um, I, I have trouble seeing like a, a split or a polarization coming. I think it's just a very political, politicized context right now. I mean, like we have a gov federal government who is going to legalize cannabis in, you know, certain situations. But uh, everybody, you know, everybody is here to support each other ultimately, I think. Other panelists, do you want to add something? So this, you know, also within our region, we discussed what uh, does it mean harm reduction and do we understand equally what harm reduction is? Uh, um, although there are a philosophy and there are like interventions listed in WHO uh, guidance, but still the understanding what harm reduction is and what influence it has to the communities is different. And uh, I don't know if we like, need to reshape of, uh, of whole understanding of harm reduction, uh, taking into account new, uh, new uh, challenges and new issues like uh, new uh, kinds of drugs and different populations, because also, after this conference, we will discuss how can we address needs of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, MSM in our region with the harm reduction interventions, because it's the, uh, um, even in this conference, it's really very less addressed issues uh, of other communities who need uh, harm reduction interventions and what these uh, uh, interventions could be for them and properly, properly it works for them. Thank you. So in 
Myanmar context too, you know, uh, uh, let me talk about the harm reduction. So, you know, there's a, a very strong community movements are there. So, you know, as we are talking before, the harm reduction concept, or harm reduction is, is the, you know, in the communities are different. So they have uh, different kinds of perceptions, but, you know, uh, to be kind of like holistic and to make the, you know, to to be a holistic uh, harm reduction approach, we also need to uh, think about the community. How should we uh, make them in the uh, harm reduction? And then how should we? This is also another important thing we have to think about. How should we? Uh, how, let's say uh, educate the community, and you know, because in a Myanmar context, uh, the power is in the community, so they can make everything. So uh, the power is in the mass, not in the not with the authority, not in the authority. So we have to think about this thing. How should we do to be a better holistic approach for the harm reduction, something like that. So now we are in this conference too, uh, and we are uh, looking and you know, it's something need to be moved forward to be a holistic approach. So uh, to be like that, we should think about the community. So that is the main thing now. And so I just wanted to wait. I, I also think that the drug user movement particularly does have a role to stretch the harm reduction movement. So for example, in uh, Geneva, in the Geneva Harm Reduction Conference, I can't remember how many years ago that was, back in the, the early, mid, mid, to mid 1990s, a group of drug users uh, came together to write a paper called, uh, uh, to, to challenge the idea of why we were discussing drugs prevention at the International Harm Reduction Conference. And it was called to prevent a human right. And we, we put forward for the first time the idea that drug use was a human right. Now, there were leading harm reduction and drug policy figures in the room who sat with their arms closed going, they'll be dancing. The quote was, they'll be dancing in the streets of Vienna tonight, i.e. you and ODC, uh, at the ridiculousness of that position. Now, now look at how prominent human rights is in our work. So I think it's sometimes recognising that that's our function to, to push you on as a wider harm reduction movement fraternally um, but also uh, strategically. Please go ahead. <laughs> My name is Pierre, I'm from Canada. Uh, again, for people who don't know, I'm the PWUD voice for the uh, SIS project in Quebec City. It's a comment or reflection, maybe I'm not in the right room, but we're talking about harm reduction and how to uh, teach our peers and how to teach people. And I think one thing that, well, I don't know if we forgot, but wouldn't it be nice if in some courses, uh, in university, college, wherever, people with whom we have to collaborate to get, well, to have our rights respected, to have our health uh, ensured, shouldn't be made aware and have mandatory harm reduction classes or courses like for uh, health, uh, people who study health, uh, law, uh, politics, and, uh, uh, sorry? Teachers. Teachers, yeah, and also the, well, policemen and whomever because most of the time we have to go and, <coughs> sorry, train these people and train and train and train but I think it's a, it's a bit of a waste of money. If the money was put, you know, prior to them actually coming into doing their work, instead of, instead of us trying to go and lobotomize them to put, them new, <laughs> put new ideas in their head, it would probably be there. Like, it would be a lot easier for all of us to stand together and protect ourselves knowing that we won't be repressed. That's my view. Um, I think you're right, uh, Pierre. I have, a, I have the chance every year, there's a doctor I know, Marie Evgoyi, she was here, um, and uh, she invited me uh, for a class called uh, Population Vulnerable, Vulnerable Population. And uh, I have to do a conference every year for the students in uh, medicine of first year. And not only, not everybody go to that classes, but I'm sitting in the back all the time and I see more than half of the students on Facebook and buying clothes online and you know, I mean, it's kind of uh, discouraging a bit, but yes, we have to make our, our voices uh, 
stronger and stronger. I try to go I, every year when I go there. I, I tell the the future doctor, take your methadone license, please take your methadone license because that too is not mandatory. You can be a doctor and not prescribe methadone, and it's okay. So yes, we have to 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 learn a lot of things to uh, everybody in all uh, fields. Thank you. I just want to caution everybody in this room to not rely on fixed site needle, needle exchanges, methadone clinics, whatever you might have to reduce an overdose rate because they are clearly not reaching the people we need to. There are six methadone clinics in Minnesota, three practicing needle exchange. Um, most of our needle exchange comes to an aid service organization where automatically drug users are automatically like subsumed by the overall bureaucracy of it and the fact that it, this aid service organization primarily exists to serve gay white men, which many of them around the country do. Um, in 2014, our, my team dropped the OD rate, OD rate by over 23%. There's no other explanation because our good SAM law did not pass until August of that year. We got no fucking credit. So then in 2016, I was seriously close to burning out. I took a year off. The OD rate went up by 40%. I don't blame myself. But it's clear there's a cause and effect, and they're not reaching the people they need to do. Our ASO hands out two cc's of naloxone per person per fucking week, and it's reprehensible. Kiss me now. Yeah. So, and the other thing is, and this is a downer, I know, but, but I, had, I had lunch with Maya Dose Simpkins from Chicago Recovery Alliance a while ago, a couple weeks ago, and she pointed out that we haven't even turned the damn corner yet. In 1996, with the AIDS epidemic and protease inhibitors, we knew the world was turning a corner. We have no idea. We're nowhere there yet. And another bad news, sorry. There's some good news at the end of this. A study was done in Minnesota of unexplained or sort of not suspicious deaths, but totally unexplained deaths. When they went back to the data, they found that the opioid death rate had been underreported by nearly 4%. That was just one year in one state with only like four or five hundred dollars, five or four or five hundred ODs in one year. So if other states start doing this, it's going to become even more for us to bear. And the last thing is, as of July 1st, when Wyoming gets its um, Good Sam law, the U.S. will have naloxone access in Good Sam laws in all 50 states. We are doing it. I think it's just to say we know why you won the, um, the Travis Jenkins Awards. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, if not, maybe I have a question to you. Uh, in the last presentation, we saw a very powerful example how to use visuals for, for advocacy. And uh, I would like to ask the rest of the group, the rest of the panelists, like, do you use uh, videos for uh, advocacy? What are your experiences? Especially in those countries, you know, where there is, like, it's, it's the, the, the publicity is quite different than... than I, just a second. I remember one time there was a French delegation coming to Montreal and uh, at uh, Acupacid we made a video on supervised injection site. It was all the myths around supervised injection and the video was so shitty. We all looked green. It was filmed with a little camera and we were reading, you know, and you could see our eyes going like that and it was really, really bad. And me and the, the, dir the director by interim at this time, we were looking on the floor, you know, and oh my God. And when the video finished, it was such a success. The French delegation loved it, you know, they wanted it. The message was strong. And that's what we learned about it. We, we, we did film that video again with more effect, but we, sadly, we lost the, 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 the cassette. But uh, anyway, yes, visual is important, and especially user's voice and real experience, lived experience. And yeah, I think visual is strong. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we cheat because uh, the team that made that the, the video is the, uh, we've now recruited them to join CoAct as well. Uh, so uh, Lexi and Igor are the video team. In fact, our next mission is to go to Kachin uh, to help uh, uh, support uh, community organizing among drug users in Kachin over the next year. And on this, we have a three missions and the second mission we are bringing Igor and Alexi out to teach the, um, uh, the uh, Myanmar drug users how to do video advocacy. 
And uh, I, I, you'll see that we've also got a great team called Select 18, who are actually a recovery-based drug user group, who I used to work with uh, one, of the, uh, one of their people, and they, they produced this fantastic video, um, which I hope you'll all sh help us share, called In Hadji's Name. Um, and then Nigel Brunson has done an also great video for us about the, the, meth, that the, the story of that part guy making a methamphetamine pipe, which again you'll find on the COAT website. Oh, that's how the microphone's okay. okay, so we take a last question and then we finish. Hi, um, I'm Alex uh, from Karmica in Vancouver. This one's a little bit of a controversial question, but um, so we focus a lot on uh, protecting drug users and advocacy for drug users and harm reduction for drug users, but there's never we never end up focusing on advocacy for people who sell drugs. And I think like, sorry, I think like recently in uh, Edmonton they just charged someone for manslaughter who uh, was uh, selling uh, fentanyl in order to feed uh, his own uh, use. Um, and so I think if you have any like examples of kind of how that can be done or kind of how to approach it, that would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I'm from uh, look, I, uh, working with drug suppliers, and uh, we tend to call them drug suppliers to try to keep it more less stigmatizing. So it's absolutely critical to our work. Um, so for example, there was an article, I, I run a, a drugs outreach team in East London and our, our, our primary referrer was a one woman drug dealer, a drug supplier in the local area. and. Uh, the, the, in fact, it was covered in an article in the independent newspaper. And it was a really positive story, but the headline was uh, even drug dealers can show some compassion was, this, uh, was the story. But I've actually written for Coact a technical briefing on how to, uh, on the existing models of working with drug suppliers. So if you want me to share that, I'm happy to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so please join me thanking the presentation.